Amazing. Well, I think the secret place we're going to get onto that, and I guess as a sub sort of title, I guess this is around. This is a seminar about about calling, our calling as worshippers, our calling as individuals, and our calling, I guess, as as God's people as well. And I think those are three distinct areas that we're gonna we're gonna touch on. I don't know about you, but I think during during the pandemic, I don't know if you noticed, but um, the uh, the timer on Netflix got a bit shorter between each episode. It was it, it used to be sort of like a ten second bar that went across, and now it's like five, four, three, two, one. It's like suddenly the next episode, right? And I think that's symptomatic of our culture. Um, we're in a, we're in an instant culture. We want everything same day delivery. We don't want to wait. We don't want to hang about. Um, and we can, yeah, you know, you get to the next episode and it's like, ah, oh, it's, it's started now. We'll just, we'll just watch the next one. It's, it's, it's started already. And I think we can often think our calling is going to be instant in the same way. We can think God will speak to us or we'll have a sense of like, oh, I think I'm called to get involved in worship in my church. And we can think we're going to go from zero to 100 incredibly rapidly. And if that doesn't happen, we can then get quite frustrated or wonder. We, well, yeah, just our hearts get a bit confused, I think, along the way. Um, and what I would say just first up is that good fruit takes time to grow. Um, and it can't be microwaved. It can't be a ready meal. It's got to be um, matured. Mike's a big fan of a, of, a, of a roast leg of lamb. And, you know, that's, that's best when it's left to, uh, to rest after it's cooked. That's, that's best when it's left to, to marinate in its juices. And in the same way, for us to grow as humans, as worshippers, it takes time which is immediately countercultural to what this world and what our culture will tell us. To unpack this, this concept of calling, just briefly, um, I think it's a word we use, we might have heard it around in Christian spheres and stuff, and I think it's a word we use to describe a sense of God-given purpose. It's not just, um, I'm feeling like this, so I'm going to do it. It's, it's usually a sense of um, a divine intervention, a divine sense that oh, this is something I'm meant to be pursuing with my life. And this might be a general sense that I hope and probably think most of us in this room have felt a call to, to worship in some way. Um, hopefully that's why you're here. You haven't just been dragged along kicking and screaming. But um, so I think it can be a general sense. I think I'm meant to be pressing into this area, but I think it can also be a specific thing, something that might just be on our lives specifically. Um, that God might have whispered to us or is made known through a prophetic word or something someone's shared with us. Um, and some of us might have a really clear sense of what that, that call is. Maybe we know exactly the lane we're meant to be running in. Um, but for others of us, it'll be a mystery. We're still discovering it. We're still working that out. And, and wherever you are on that, on that journey, um, it's great you're here. And it's great that you're wanting to press into that, is what I'd say first and foremost. I think calling is often where our gifting and our passions intersect. That's something to be mindful of as we're, you know, is this the Lord or is it indigestion? You know, is it, is it, is it an obvious thing where it's like, oh, I think I'm, I'm good at this and this is also what I love doing. Where those two things collide, often I think God can, can put a calling on our lives. So that's something to be considering when we're thinking about calling. And for some of us, God might reveal sort of the trajectory of our calling all at once. Like, it's going to look like this. This is your life. And for others, it might be more of a step-by-step -step thing. Um, and he'll give enough light for the next step at each, at each time you need the next, the next thing. So first and foremost, as, as worshippers, as God's people, I'd encourage us, let's not just once, not just at a conference, but let's keep going back to him and asking him to reveal his plans for our lives, to reveal what he's got for us and asking him to lead us in the day in, day out. And by doing that, you know, that, that honours him. That's a life of worship where we're surrendered and we're saying, you know, for one of a better phrase, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, I surrender to you, Lord. Would you be the king of my life? Um, and let him lead our steps. And as we just heard from, from Mike next door, our calling as worshippers is to, is to love God, love people, and love music in that order. And we can't compromise on that. It's got to be God first and music last. And of course, it's important for us to practice our instruments. We want to be excellent. We want to bring our best for the Lord. That's really important. But we've got to keep our attention and affection on him more than on nailing that guitar riff or nailing that part, getting the track ready, all that stuff. Um, it's more important that our heart is for him and that our character can sustain our gifting 
in the long term. That's, that's what God's after. And as a generation, you might have caught this, just if you go on social media for 30 seconds, um, we long to be discovered. We long to be discovered as a generation. But God says we need to be developed. So that's, again, a big jarring thing with, with culture. You know, there's a lot of people who want to be influencers out there, who want to be YouTubers, who want to be the next big thing. Um, but actually, um, just like a Polaroid photo, we've got to be taken into the dark and be developed in that space before we're ready to then be brought out into the light. And if we're exposed to the light, like that, like that Polaroid photo, if we're exposed to the light too soon, it actually damages the image. And so if we're exposed to the light too soon, um, we'll be destroyed. Um, and that's not what we want. <laughs> we want to go for the long haul. We want to be worshipping Jesus our whole lives long rather than just um, going for a short burst and then burning out. In essence, the light that is in us, the reflection of him, um, needs to be greater than the light that is on us or it's going to crush us. We need to be anointed in secret rather than paraded in public. And Jesus modeled this so well for us, didn't he? You know, he withdrew so regularly to spend time with the Father. And that's just in, in the gospel accounts of his life. That's the documented part. But he only started his ministry when he was around 30 years old. And so there's 30 years of, of, of history that he will have had spending time with the Lord, um, you know, making tables and chairs the best tables and chairs in the whole of the world, <laughs> I imagine. But um, he probably spent a lot of time with God that we don't even know about. And in the same way, I think we're called to operate out of that secret place with the Lord. And it's not so much a physical place we go to, although that can be helpful for, for certain people, you know, if that, if that helps you engage, that's great. But it's less about a physical place as it is about the practice of just getting into his presence, of spending time with him. And I thought... What could, be, what could be helpful for today is just to look at a few lessons from the life of David, um, you know, the ultimate worshipper and, and the model of that in the Bible, really. Um, and I'm sure most of us will know his story pretty well. Um, but just as, a, as an overview, you know, he wrote quite a few of the Psalms. Um, he was the guy who killed a giant with a pebble, and he eventually became the king of Israel. But before all of that, he was the youngest son of a guy called Jesse, and his job was to look after the sheep. And just to remind ourselves of how um, David's journey started, we're just going to read the story of, um, of when the prophet Samuel anointed him. So if you've got a Bible, you might want to grab it, turn with me, or if you've got a phone and you want to look it up, follow it along just to make sure I'm not making it up. Um, feel free to, to read along. I'll just read for us um, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then made Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? 
There is still the youngest, Jesse replied. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. So David was anointed by Samuel. He was the unexpected one. He was the shepherd boy who gets called to be the king. Um, it must have been an incredible moment for David going from just being like, oh, your dad's calling you, and then suddenly you, your life's completely changed in its, in its course, in, in the call that's been put on his life. It, I think it must have been sort of like a golden buzzer moment in Britain's Got Talent, you know, when the confetti's coming down and everyone's like jumping around and celebrating. Simon Cowell's probably coming up to give you a hug. I doubt David knew much about Simon Cowell, but um, it was definitely a big deal for him. But I guess something that I, I hadn't realised until recently is that um, it's actually, biblical scholars reckon, it's about 20 years between the time that David's anointed to the time that he's then appointed as king. And it was actually in the space between, in, in times of, of, of secrecy, of obscurity, that God made him into the king that he needed to be. And in our day and age, um, lots of us want the palace without the process. And we often just care about the destination. It's like, God's told me I'm going to do this, so I'm just going to get on with it and go and do it. Um, but it's actually beyond the destination that God calls us to. He cares about who we become along the way. It's not just the destination or the activity that he cares about. It's, it's our heart posture. It's, are we loving people along the way? Are we learning along the way? And for many of us, if we were released now into the things we long for and pray for, there's a possibility they'd actually crush us. Um, and so I guess just to pose a question, and this is to provoke thought, um, and it's for you to weigh, but you know, maybe those things that aren't happening yet that you're longing for, maybe that's because God actually knows it wouldn't be good for you right now, or maybe you're not quite ready. Um, and you know, is he saying, focus on the few that I've put right in front of you rather than imagining the multitudes? Is he saying, um, prioritise time with me before I start expanding your circles and your horizons? Um, is he saying, get better at managing your own time and your own life before I make you, um, give you leadership over, over a bunch of others? It's just something to, to, to think about um, beyond today, I guess. Just questions to pose. So I'd love to just share five main points with you, just from, the, from the, that story we just read, um, from the life of David. And the first one of them is this, God chooses. Um, he's the Lord, and he chooses certain people for certain purposes. And so my encouragement to all of us would be, let's, let's align ourselves with what he's already doing, um, rather than thinking we're the answer or um, the next big thing or anything like that. You know, as Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. So in the same way, let's, let's try and be open to, uh, to the fact that he chooses. He's probably put people in positions for a reason. And so let's, let's partner with him, choose to cheer people on rather than thinking, how can I, how can I achieve? How can I get there? Um, he only gives us grace for the race that he's called us to. Um, and he doesn't have to sustain what he didn't start. So... For us creatives, I guess, like, you know, we often are really keen to throw ourselves into getting stuck in, often sometimes to the point of burnout. We'll, we'll just keep going and going and going because we, we love music, we love serving, we love Jesus. All of those are great things. But my question would be, if we're wondering why we're so burned out trying to make things happen, um, maybe it's because it's not actually what he's, um, he's called you to specifically. And I'm not saying stop serving. Definitely keep serving. The local church needs worshippers. But, um, but he knows best, you know. What's he, what's he already doing that you can partner with that will be easier than maybe launching that new thing or, um, yeah, just putting more workload on yourself? You know, what's he already doing that you can join with? And I just say to all of us, um, 
you know, our value isn't in becoming the next big thing, but becoming who he's made us to be as his worshippers, as his people. Again, he cares about the process. He cares about who we're becoming. He cares that we're um, becoming more and more like him every day. That's got to be our prayer, right? To be more like Jesus. If it's not that, then as Mike said, we're missing the point. We've got to love him and try and become more like him. And he does the work in our hearts in that time. And with all the social media stuff, which can be pretty toxic and a bit of a minefield, um, I don't know if anyone else struggles with that, but I definitely have to take breaks from social media. Um, Our generation will tell us to chase visibility, but we've got to get this, um, we've got to get this and drill this into the generation that is coming, um, that visibility is not the same as significance. And actually, normal people, all of us just doing the stuff week in, week out in local church and the name of Jesus being praised across the whole world is how lives get changed. The church is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world. Not Brandon Lake, not Bethel, not Hillsong, not a brand, not a church or a mega church, but it's, it's all of us playing our part. It's one body, but lots of moving parts making it all happen, isn't it? And... Yeah, I'll just say this. If all we want is man's approval and a well done, that's all we're going to get. That's all we're going to get. But instead, in private, let's, let's pursue him. Let's seek his well done. Let's seek his well done, good and faithful servant. That's like the prize. That's what we're running for. That's what we're aiming for. Years ago, there was a guy called Colin. He used to be our drummer here when Matt Redman was our worship pastor. And um, he went off to go and study to go and get ordained. And when he did, Mike just caught up with him. He was a good friend and just said, you know, hey, we'd love to hear, you know, things you thought we do great here, but also things that you think we could grow in or that are our blind spots. And Colin just paused for a bit and then said, you're doing loads of great stuff for the wider church, for the national, you know, bunch of people. Um, But that's all great and visible. And then he just said, but I just wonder, where are you investing in obscurity? Where are you investing in obscurity where only God sees, where it's not a platform, where it's not for, for the whole wider church to be invited? And Mike says, you know, it's stuck with him ever since, of just like, oh, wow, that's, that's what it's about. That's the heart. It's got to be, you know, it's our delight to serve the wider church, but it's got to also be um, about the one, hasn't it? We leave the 99 for the one. Um, We're called to serve people in the unseen, not just our churches. And if you, I guess, another couple of challenges, just questions for us to to mull on, I guess, would just be, you know, he chooses and and he, I think, appoints at the right time. He anoints, but then he appoints when we're we're ready. Um, And so I just ask, you know, how much can he trust us with um, before jealousy for someone else's gifting kicks in? Um, you know, comparison's a killer. Can he trust you to handle that, to manage your own emotions and to bring them before him? Um, you know, he chooses the, the lane that we're to run in. And our aim has got, to, has got to be pursue him, chase after him, not to be the next Brooke Liggettwood or Chris Tomlin or whatever. Because um, that's what Instagram would suggest. It's like, if you're not on tour, if you're not writing songs that the local church is singing, that's, you know you're not doing anything worthwhile. But that's so not true, guys. We've got to get back to serving him in the secret place, serving him in the mundane, in the day in, day out, the showing up on a Sunday and going for another round, you know? That's what it's all about. So first yeah, first up, God chooses. Just grab a drink. The rest of these are a bit quicker, so we're going to fly through. Um, point number two. Sometimes you're not invited to your own party. Um, as I've said already, let's, let's not get caught up in a social media swirl or chasing after other people's lives, idolizing that. Live, live your life. You know, God's placed you where you are for a reason. Otherwise, you'll just get consumed by this, this fear of missing out and, um, and, and a feeling of inadequacy and like you're not enough. Um, you know, if David lived in a social media age, he probably would have had to unfollow or block Saul pretty quick 
just, you know, the hashtags would have been flying around, you know, hashtag still king from Saul or um, hashtag hunting David, you know, it wouldn't have been great. You know, David would have been a bit overwhelmed and a bit like, oh, this is, this is terrifying. Um, it wouldn't have been ideal. So we've got to remember, David wasn't even invited to the anointing party. When Samuel showed up to, to view the sons of Jesse, David was still out in the field, and it's almost like his dad had forgotten his name. It's like, oh yeah, there's that, that, that other one, but he didn't even, know, you know, didn't even name him. Um, they had to go and get him. But when we're not invited to that event, when we don't get the promotion yet, when we, when we aren't full-time worship leading, writing songs to the church, or whatever our sense of calling is, in the space between, if we let him, we get developed by God. And it's precious time. You know, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Psalm 24, verse 3 to 4 says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And we've got to, we've got to keep our hearts pure, away from comparison, away from striving to be like that person. Um, and we've got to uproot bitterness. Real quick, guys, the amount of worshippers and creatives that get taken out by bitterness or offence is uh, alarming, to say the least. Um, we've got to be maintaining the soil of our hearts regularly. Um, yeah, if you're not a gardener of your own heart yet, become a gardener of your own heart pretty rapidly, is my advice. So that's number two. That's sometimes you're not invited to your own party. Thirdly, first impressions aren't always right. David's dad and even Samuel the prophet didn't necessarily see the call on, on David's life to start with, but God gets it right. He's always doing a new thing. And so for us, we don't have to look like a generation of worshippers that went before. We can model something different. We can bring something new. Um, we just have to keep chasing after him. Proverbs 3 tells us, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outside. That's the 1232 train, just in case anyone was wondering. Um, man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Let him do a deep work in your heart now. Um, while you're still maybe in the dark room, let, like, and if you're not in the dark room, if you're serving week in, week out, take the time to withdraw, you know, take the time to, to step away, to just spend time in his presence. But in essence, in that dark room, let him get all the dirt and the muck and the stuff that all of us have, let him get that out of you now so that then when the next thing comes or when you're pushed into a position that you weren't expecting quite yet, um, that stuff's not going to come out when you're in the light. It's not going to get messy. It's not going to get ugly. Let him, let him develop you in private. Um, and in the, in the space between, keep, keep serving him in anonymity, in obscurity. Because if you can't do it where you're at, you're never going to last when, it, when, the, when the next thing comes or when he calls you on. And I guess we've got we've to be gripped by the, this idea of becoming more like him than we are of getting likes on social media. You know? We've got to be marked by God. Let him put a seal and a calling on our hearts rather than trying to be marketed by, by man. And... Being marked by him looks like becoming more like him and being set apart for his glory. You know, I just remember like the, the Levites in the Old Testament, you know, they, they were to be set apart. They were to be holy. They had um, rituals and things they had to do before they came before the presence of God because it was that holy. It was that serious a task. And I guess for us as, as, as worshippers, you know, music's fun, isn't it? Like it's fun to, to be involved with serving um, in a worship band at church, or at least I hope you have fun when you're doing it. It's meant to be fun, people. Um, but it's, it's remembering that it's fun, but it's also it's this weighty responsibility. As Mike was saying, it's something, it's something holy. We're coming before the King of Kings. We're coming before the Holy of Holies. And we've got to feel the weight of that as well as enjoy the joy of that. Um, Moses spent so much time in God's presence that his face literally, literally glowed. He was literally transformed physically by, by spending so much time in that secret place with God. And I'm not suggesting we invest in glow-in-the-dark paint and just sort of get our faces all glowing, but um, 
we do need to withdraw, don't we? We've got we've to pursue his presence in private and let that satisfy us. Whilst a Polaroid photo gets developed once and is then the photo is there, it's ready for all to see, uh, we humans need a bit more work, um, so we've got to regularly withdraw. It's not just a one-time thing. We've got to keep going back to the secret place to be developed more. And we've got to learn to be satisfied in him, or sooner or later we're going to start looking to, to people or things or um, other stuff to satisfy a desire in us that only he can fill. He's got to be the one to satisfy us. So that's number three. First impressions aren't always right. Fourthly, we're coming into land. We're getting there, people. Don't worry. There's no such thing as an overnight success. And, and to, the truth be told, guys, like our, our calling, our mental, we never arrive on this side of, of heaven, you know? We're worshippers now, and we're going to be worshippers forevermore. So um, don't put some sort of measurement or limit on how God wants to use you when it comes to worship. Don't think... Um, you know, oh, when I get that job or when I start leading there or um, when I get this number of followers, when, when I release this project, that's like, I've done it. Tick box, I've now accomplished my calling. It's like, it doesn't stop with uh, an achievement, even if that's the right phrase. But, we, you know, we never know what he wants to do in us and through us. He does, he's the God who does immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And so let's not limit him or box him. Even if we've got a really strong sense of, oh, this is my lane, this is my calling. Let's not limit him. What if he's, he's a God of surprises, right? He's a God who can do the impossible. And so let's not limit him or think, ah, oh, this is just my thing now and I'm just going to chill here for the rest of my, rest of my days. Um, let's not limit him. And let's not give up when it takes longer than we expect to get to the place we're wanting to get to. David waited 20 years. 20 years. That's a long time. And I wonder, you know, if God told you today that it's going to take 20 years for your calling to come to pass, how many of us are actually willing to wait? In this instant culture, in this instant culture, how many of us are actually willing to, to do the hard work, to, to be crushed, to be pressed, to be refined? Um, you know, would we wait or would we just sack it? Would we just go, oh, it hasn't happened in a year, two years. I don't feel like I'm getting there. I don't feel like I'm doing anything. I think our willingness to be crushed is actually the extent to which God can work through us. And we've got to regularly bring ourselves before him and offer our hearts, offer our lives again. Let him do that process in us. It's a daily decision, isn't it? It's a, yes, it's a one-time thing of like, oh, yeah, this is my call. This is my call. I'm going to go for it, Lord. But... How does that practically look day in, day out? It looks, I think, like just surrendering. It looks like saying yes to him, to his will, his timing, his plans. So yeah, no such thing as an overnight success and we don't arrive this side of eternity. And finally, this one might come as a surprise, although if you've been alive for longer than a few hours, you'll know life's not fair. Life is not fair, that is point five. David went through a lot of rubbish, a lot of stuff between the fields when he got called to the palace. That 20 years of, of waiting wasn't spent relaxing on a beach in southern France. This was a harrowing time for David. This was tough. And maybe you've got a sense, I'm called to do something. I'm called to, to step into leadership in my church in the area of worship. Maybe you feel like, oh, currently I play an instrument, but maybe I'm called to lead worship. Or maybe you just, you're just here and you're not really sure what, where you slot in, but you feel like a heart and you, you love worshipping. Maybe that's you. Um, in that space between, in the waiting, you know, just keep checking your heart. Keep checking your heart. You know, how do you cope when people who are seemingly less able than you get promoted? And when they, when they seem to be less faithful, and yet they're the ones who are getting the visibility. Like, how, do you, how are you coping with that? How, how's your heart? You know, keep checking it. Keep checking it. David was anointed as king over Israel. And then the next thing we read in 1 Samuel is that he had to go and take a pat lunch to his brothers. <laughs> um, you know, in that space, he had to learn to serve others with humility. And I'm pretty sure his, his brothers would have been mocking him. You know, oh, here's the king bringing us our lunch. Thanks, Dave. 
you know it would have been it would have been it would have felt odd it would have felt strange he might have even started to question was that was that real did i dream that did i dream that or was that you lord and then he got recruited to play music for Saul who was being tormented by an evil spirit and so he got roped into the palace you know david was a shepherd he was a shepherd boy he, his comfort zone was the fields his comfort zone was sheep and fighting off the occasional wild animal. He didn't know how a palace worked. And so God placed him there in the palace so he could just observe. He'd be in the courts, he'd be playing music, he'd be doing something he knew. Um, but he placed him there so he could learn the rules of the game before he had to play it himself. And in the same way for us, you know, if we're already serving in a team and we feel called to, the, to another a level of leadership or to press into more, you know, maybe... God's just trying to get you to catch the culture. Maybe he's trying to get you to understand the rules so that when the moment comes for you to step up, you know how to play the game. You know how to play by the rules. David had to grow into the kingship. And for, again, for us, too much exposure, too soon on the Polaroid photo, will wipe us out, will destroy us, won't make us as we were meant to be. Then David, the rest of his life, he was promoted in the army. He had to learn leadership. He had to learn how to lead a whole group of, of people. And then he succeeded. He wasn't just, the Bible says, you know, the Lord was with him. And so David succeeded at everything he put his hand to. So he succeeded and then he got the adulation of the crowds. And he had to learn how to handle that. And the crowds even started singing, Saul has slain his hundreds and David his thousands. And I'd ask, um, ask all of us, you know, how do you cope with being maybe more popular than those in leadership above you? You know, do you undermine them? Do you tease them behind their back? Or do you honour them and respect them and love them and appreciate that they're the Lord's anointed and maybe the Lord's put, put them there above you for a reason for this season? Then David had to learn survival. Um, you know, he was on the run from Saul for years, hiding in caves. That wasn't glamorous. That wasn't the palace. That wasn't the plan. Hey, you're going to be the next king. I didn't think that would involve hiding in a cave for years and years and years with a bunch of other guys, you know. And he had to learn to strengthen himself in the Lord, to encourage himself. And I guarantee that was probably, he first started learning that and writing a few of those psalms of lament and psalms of, of where are you, God? How long, Lord? You can, bet, you can bet your life that was when he was in the caves and just questioning, how on earth are you going to take me from this to being the king of this whole country? He had a ton to, ton to learn, didn't he? And like over the course of his life, we see God was just growing him step by step, step by step, baby steps. And he, he grew him into the king that he needed to be. And I guess as an encouragement for all of us, what we can take from that is that if he's assigned us, if, if we feel like he's anointed us for a purpose, you can guarantee like he'll find us when we're ready. He'll get us to where we need to be when we're ready. We can trust in his timing. Isaiah 14 verse 27 says, The Lord of heaven's armies has spoken. Who can change his plans? When his hand is raised, who can stop him? And, you know, we sing in songs, you know, who can stop the Lord Almighty? You know, do we believe it? In the season we're in, do we believe it? Who can stop the Lord? If he wants you somewhere, he's God. He can get, you, know, he can get you there. Um, there's no one in the universe that can stop him if he wants to open a door for you. So trust his timing and, and keep trying to grow. Be intentional in growing in the space in between. Um, keep trying to get, get better rather than getting bitter if you're feeling frustrated. And allow yourself to be developed in the dark room. So those are the five, five little lessons from, from David's life I think could be helpful for us um, to take away and think about. And just very quickly, three practical steps for us. You know, what does it look like? Secret place, day in, day out, going from this place. Conferences are great. It can be mountaintops. But then it's like we're going back into the valley. We're going back into um, the reality of day in, day out life. So firstly, it's obvious. You know, I think most of us will get this. But firstly, spend time with him. Firstly, spend time with him. Let's remember that Christianity, before anything else, is a relationship. And if you starve a relationship or a friendship of, of time... It's going gonna, it's gonna to die pretty quick. So we've got to be intentional in carving out time to be with him and working out what that looks like for each of us on a regular basis. John chapter 15 verse 4 says, Remain in me 
and I, will and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. We could just sit on that for a little while as worshippers of like, if we're, if we're not in him, if we're not getting to spend time with him regularly, it's like Mike says, you know, what are we really bringing? It'll just be, it's got to be out of the overflow of relationship with him that we bring, bring our gifts, we bring um, our leadership to the table. And our secret place, if, if you get one thing from this seminar, it's basically this, our secret place is him. Our secret place is him. You know, it has to be him. Running back to him when we mess up, asking him to purify our hearts when other motives seem to creep in. Yearning to encounter him for a fresh revelation. Lord, take me deeper. Remind me again. Take me back to my first love. And strengthening ourselves in him when times are tough. And above all else, enjoying him. Enjoying him. The first article of the Shorter Westminster Catechism says that the chief end of man is to worship God and enjoy him forever. Enjoy him forever. Not just worship as an activity, but as, a, as an overflow of joy, as an overflow of delight in him. And so, just practically, just going to be really honest, that means we need to be worshipping when we're not planning a set list. Um, that means we need to uh, worship when we're not just practicing and learning the songs. It means we've got to get into the word of God on days other than a Sunday when we're in a church building um, and the preacher says, open your Bibles or whatever. We've got to be getting into his word and feasting on it regularly. Not out of duty or a sense of, these are the rules, I've got to play by them, but because we want to, because we need to. This is... It's got to be a, a realisation that it's a need as much as, as a desire. It's a choice to carve out that time. In the Lord's Prayer, we say the words, give us today our daily bread, don't we? And, and, and until recently, I would say, I've just always thought about that as practical. And I think it totally is. Um, you know, we need food. That's a good thing. And God is a, is a good giver. So he loves to give us that. But it struck me the other day that Jesus described himself as the bread of life as well. And so when we pray that, give us today our daily bread, we're actually almost praying for, for more of him. And so, and so let's feast on him. Let's be hungry for him. Um, let's not settle for Christian karaoke. Um, let's pursue him. You know, that's what we need. Our worship sets don't need more synths or um, better tracks or um, better blended harmonies. They need Jesus. You know, it's got to be about him. And, and if we lead out of a place of overflow, of love for him, that's, that's where the power comes. That's where there's an anointing, I think, in, in worship. So that's firstly, spend time with him. Super obvious, but jot it down if you can. Secondly, lead others to where we've been before. Um, I think worship leading is a little bit like Google Maps. You know, you're there, to, you're there to guide people deeper into territory they haven't been yet or they might be unfamiliar with. You're there to provide direction, but not to hold the focus. Like if there was a driver just focusing on the sat-nav or the phone while they're driving, it would be pretty terrifying and you'd crash pretty quick. Instead, the, the aim is that the driver um, and the passengers can focus on the surroundings and where they're going. Um, they can focus on um, the rolling landscape, you know, his vastness, his beauty, his greatness. And, and so Google Maps just draws us along the road, doesn't it? It paints where we're going. And so that's our job. It's not dominating and getting in the way, but providing enough of a steer that you get people to a place of adoration as individuals and, and corporately as, as the church. And you can only really lead people when you know the way. Like Google Maps without data is scuppered. Like it doesn't work, you know, in the same way. We've got to have that time to, to download, to be in his presence, to, to get fresh revelation of who he is. And then... Um, and then to show people where we've already explored, what we're already enjoying. Our task as worshippers is ultimately to know him intimately and then lead others into that place of intimacy. And I, just to say, guys, as well, I know there's probably a whole bunch of worship leaders as well as just musicians who serve in, in, a, in a Sunday band, and that's brilliant. And I just want to say that it, the same thing applies for the musicians. As Mike said, it's, um, it's one team. It's one team leading. We've all got to have a, a hunger for this. Um, Someone who has a rich history with God, I think, will know when to add parts in on the electric guitar, will know when to be sensitive and hold back on drums, because you're not trying to dominate or prove your ability. You're trying to serve the moment, and you're trying to serve the Lord. Um, 
our, our heart's got to be, when we get up to serve, it's got to be, the aim has got to be to serve the people in front of us rather than having something to prove or like, I'm, I'm here to showcase what I can do. And so in that sense, we need character and gifting hand in hand. And it takes time. It takes time to grow character. It takes time to grow gifting. But we need both. So I guess as our prayer, let's, let's be asking God to reveal more of himself to us so that then we can point others to, to him better, to paint a clearer image of who he is in what we sing and how we play. And ultimately, revelation always leads to worship, doesn't it? So as we point to who he is, people won't be able to help themselves but join us. That's why everything we sing has got to be, got to be truthful. Um, you know, just... An example, you know, take the bridge of what a beautiful name. I'm sure it's a song we're all pretty familiar with. But, you know, the words, you have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. You know, that's just truth straight out of scripture. And we put it to a singable melody and the room erupts, doesn't it? And it's the same thing. If we could do that for our whole set list, just pointing people to the truth, getting people to, getting truth onto people's lips in worship, that is the key so let's make sure our songs reflect our theology let's make sure they're more about him than they're about us and also let's and if we're serious about christianity being a relationship let's not just sing songs about god those those have their place let's sing songs to him as well you are beautiful you are great you are mighty you are worthy let's sing to him um, to express our love for him relationally out of the overflow of our fellowship and communion with him and, and thirdly and finally, and we are very much about to finish, so thank you for listening so patiently. Um, Ephesians 4, I'd just love to read us a bit of that. So this is Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll see how far we get. Um, this is Paul. He says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ, Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. And then just to skip to verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers and, in brackets from me, the worshippers, um, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's, that's it, guys. <laughs> Let's live in that. And um, there's a lot there we can, we can say. But just very briefly, I'll just say, as, as um, musicians, uh, as creatives, we're usually more towards the touchy-feely end of the, of the emotional scale. Um, and so let's be really intentional in um, guarding our hearts and being gentle, being humble, taking on board feedback, taking on board... Um, maybe criticism with a view to help us improve. Um, let's bear with one another, the person that fluffs the riff, the person that hasn't learned the song for one Sunday. You know, um, Let's just keep loving people as we've been loved by him. Um, yeah, let's just remember the great commission Jesus gave us is to love God. And we do that. We sing songs to him all the time. But then to love people as well is key. Love our neighbour as ourself. And he told us to build his church, to equip it, to love it even when it's tough. Even when you maybe even disagree with how the leadership wants worship done. Will you sit in that space? Will you serve? Will you come under that? Will you honour? Will you um, cheer them on as they seek to lead? As they seek to honour the call on their life, just as you're trying to do the same thing. Let's just keep checking our hearts. So, yeah, be patient. Bear with one another. Be humble. Um, and just to finish, I'll just say this. The mark of a successful worshipper, um, and it's particularly a worship leader, is actually to be forgotten. It's actually to be forgotten and to point people to him and not themselves. 
throughout history. I don't know, maybe you're more of an expert in church history and worshippers over the years than I am, but in terms of how many worship leaders I'm aware of, in my head, it's basically King David wrote a lot of the Psalms. There's obviously other people who wrote the Psalms, but King David and then Mary, who we heard anointed Jesus with perfume. That's like a big expression of worship that Jesus told us to, to look at of, of what he was looking for in worship. And maybe a few hymn writers, Charles Wesley, some of those guys who wrote, you know, some of the, the songs we still sing today. But aside from that, there's been 2,000 years of, of worshipping Jesus, and I don't know too many other names of, of worshippers and worship leaders. And I think that just shows that they've done a good job rather than a bad job. Um, yeah, I think we've only started making worship leaders into celebrities in the last century. And it's, it's just mirrored culture of what, at the same time as singers and performers and others have become celebrities. We've basically just caught that culture and it's sort of infected the church and we sort of put people on pedestals maybe um, where we shouldn't. And we need to ultimately regain the art of anonymity and we need to choose obscurity. And it is a choice. We can push ourselves out there. We can show, us, show off what we can do. I'm sure there's a lot of very talented musicians and singers in here some very capable and gifted people. But will we choose to be forgotten and point to the one who will forever be and who is forever worthy and who will be singing holy, 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 worthy, worthy, worthy around the throne forever too? The angels still haven't got bored of that, by the way. They're still going and we're going to join in one day. Um, and Tom always uses this analogy, so apologies if you've heard it before, but our job as, as worship teams is to put one hand, um, grab one hand, the hand of the congregation, and one hand, the hand of God, and bring them together, and then get out of the way. We're just bringing the Lord and, and the people together, and then getting out of the way. So yeah, keep the first thing first, which is him. That's our secret place. That's our, our retreat, our hiding place, our hope, our joy. Our, um, our call as worshippers. Keep God in your heart. Be set apart for him. Let's keep retreating regularly to the dark room, choosing that, choosing time in his presence. Um, and in that secret place, letting his truth define us, letting, um, letting his light guide us, and letting his love realign our perspective. Let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Um, Amen. Is that all right? Sorry, that was a lot. And I feel like we've, we ventured away from the secret place for a bit. We came back. We've been, we've been all around the block. But I hope some of that was helpful. Um, if anyone's got any questions, we've got... Oh, we've got two minutes. <laughs> um, but I'll hang around afterwards as well. If anyone, just quick fire. Maybe we've got time for one or two questions. If there may be like more circumstance-specific to like advice on how you're doing things in your local context, maybe just come find me afterwards. But... Any questions, I'd be really happy to answer now. Just shout and I'll save for the recording. But if not, we can leave it. We'll leave 15 seconds of awkward silence and if no one speaks, we'll end the session. But if you've got a question, just raise your hand or shout it out. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Wow, yeah. So for the recording, how can we encourage young people in today's day and age, to be still and quiet in the Lord's presence? Um, I think, well, that's a big question. Um, I think, I think modelling it. If, if, I don't know if you do like prayer meetings or anything like that, but, but getting the young people around people who, who already get it and, and modelling that. Um, and also, to be honest, teaching on it and having preaching and, and why that's important, what's the value of that. Um, we're very blessed to have... Uh, a senior pastor whose who's passion is for worship, and so we regularly have teaching on worship. But um, if that's not something that already happens, I'd encourage you to push for that in your local context. It's great to, to chat about worship and to put context around why we do what we do. Anyone else? Yes. So how do we, yeah, for the recording, how do we balance the theology of a hymn with the accessibility of a more modern worship song? Yeah, um, I'd say a arrangement, 
in terms of like how you how you're doing it musically. Um, and we 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 try our best to include. Um, I think I don't want to take away from what Tom's going to say in this next session, but um, there's some gold coming. Um, so hopefully that will answer your question. But in essence, we try and include a hymn at least one or one in every set, or at least you know one in every two Sundays. There's going to be something that people can. So we've got that depth of theology. But um, I just say as well, just like be discerning of your context. If no one knows modern worship songs and you're still on like singing lots of hymns like stick with that and then gradually bring in the the newer stuff if that feels right um and then the ones that you do introduce just make sure they're really rich in theology too so that people get on board and catch the the heart and the vision of that um yeah i hope that's helpful sweet any other questions brilliant well, guys, thank you so much for listening so patiently. I'm very used to hiding behind an acoustic guitar, so this is a new thing for me. Thank you for bearing with. Um, it's lunchtime right now. We're gonna.